right, welcome everybody. How's everybody doing? Can you guys? Good, how are you? I'm good, thank you. You can, everybody can hear me? I'm outside, so I just wanna make sure it's clear. Okay, yeah, I, for anyone that lives in Denver, they are replacing the pipes um, throughout all of Denver, a 15 year project. Um, they are doing it in my neighborhood right now. Today they took the day off for some reason, <laughs> so I'm gonna enjoy outside. Otherwise there's like jackhammers going on out here. Um, anyway, okay, well nice to see everybody. Um, and um, today we're gonna begin doing some work with um, systems of differential equations. Um, so um, we started way back on the first day. So we're working with um, worksheet 14 today. Um, so the first problem here should look familiar. This is what um, was in the video. Uh, so just to be clear, um, the material, so this is chapter three. Um, this material won't be on the exam that you have next week. So I just wanna give a little preview for what we'll get into after the exam. Um, so I did put some review materials or a practice um, problem sheet up online um, this morning. So if you wanna get some practice in for the exam over the weekend, you can take a look at those. I'll put solutions to that up shortly as well. Um, so for Monday, there's no work. There's no homework that is due. There's no uh, reading quiz. We'll just get ready for the exam on Monday and then you'll have the exam on Wednesday. Um, so any questions about that before we get started? Yeah, I did have a question about yeah. the exam. It said it's gonna be over Zoom. Mm -hmm. so it'll be a live exam. What should we do if we have like technical issues or something happens during the test? Um, so I'll be on Zoom and um, I'll be checking my email. So um, if something should happen, then um, clearly if you're unable to email or Zoom, you'll just have to, the best you can do is just contact me um, once you get your technology restored. Uh, hopefully it's not an issue, but um, if it is an issue, then the best thing to do is just keep me informed as best you can during the exam. Okay, so then we just would, there's like going to be like a link that's going to open up the exam at 11, and then we would just click that. Is that how it's going to work? Yeah, we, we can talk about this on Monday, but um, there, it will be online. Part of it will be similar to the reading quizzes. It'll be a quiz questions, multiple choice that you enter into Canvas, um, and the majority, of, so there'll be a, a handful of questions like that, and then the majority of it will be short answer, show your work sort of stuff that you'll, there'll be a PDF of those problems. You can print it out or whatever you want to do with it. And then um, you can up, you'll upload that work similar to you do um, with your homework. Okay. Um, but I'll pass along more information as far as like what you're allowed to use during the exam, what you're not permitted to do, how it will be administered. Um, I can pass along more information about that over the weekend and we can talk about it on, on Monday. Okay, sounds good, thanks. Yep. Okay, um, any, anything else? Uh, okay, so um, we'll be working with um, systems of differential equations for you know, the next couple of weeks. Um, this is what the material will be on your second exam and then we'll cover a little bit of additional stuff after um, this, after exam two. So um, we actually did start on day one kind of thinking about systems of differential equations. Um, may recall um, that. And so the video just kind of went through how we can read the differential equations and what these different terms tell us uh, about the system. And so we've got rabbits, we have foxes. Foxes are predators and they prey on rabbits. So um, we could see that from this equation by looking at kind of this mixed term over here. And we can think about this as what happens when there are both rabbits and foxes present and they interact with each other. The fact that this is negative, we can see that when rabbits and foxes interact, that's bad for the rabbit, um, but that is good for the fox. And so that's how we can identify which is the predator, which is the prey, and how we could see that this is indeed even a predator-prey um, relation. Um, so. Any, any questions about that, about the video or the reading quiz? Okay, so um, the plan for today is to take a look at systems 
and maybe revisit some of the techniques that we used with one single differential equation and see how we can extend them to systems. So um, the nice thing here is we're really not going to require to learn any new techniques, but just kind of extend the techniques we've worked with to systems. And in the process, we'll actually review some stuff that will be on the exam. So if you think back to when we were first looking at one differential equation, we first talked about ways that we can approximate solutions using Euler's method um, and using uh, phase lines and things like this to look at equilibrium and stuff like that. So I want to kind of introduce how those ideas work with systems of differential equations. So um, the first thing that I want to kind of review is how we can kind of apply Euler's method to a system of differential equations. Um, and so if it's not clear what's happening, um, R is denoting the rabbit population F the fox population, T is time in years. And as time goes on, both the rabbits and foxes, their populations are changing. But what's different about this system now is that the, they are affecting each other. So the number of foxes doesn't just affect the fox population, but it also affects the rabbit population. And that's why we get this system of interrelated equations. So um, if we wanted to apply Euler's method to this, um, then what we can do is we can calculate approximately how much is R going to change by using this differential equation up here. So I could take the one and the one, plug it in for R in F, and I would get three minus 1.4. Um, and so that would give me 1.6. And so just recall what this 1.6 tells us is um, every year, approximately the rabbit population is increasing by about 1.6. And we can think about that as um, like hundreds of rabbits. So that's like saying every year, the rabbit population is going up by about 160 rabbits. And um, if we're gonna be using a delta T value of say half a, half a year, so if this tells me rabbit population goes up by 1.6 every year, if we increase by half a year, then what's the approximate change in the rabbit population? Any thoughts? Is it going to go up by 1.6 over the course of half a year? Uh, just half of it, 0.8. Yeah, so we scale that down um, to take into account that we're not changing T by a full year, but only by half a year. So if it goes up by 1.6 over a full year approximately, then for half a year, it's going to go up by approximately half as much. And um, then we can do the same for the foxes, but now we've got two different populations that we need to account for. So we could take the one and the one, plug it into the fox equation, and that would give me one, um, excuse me, minus one plus 0 0.08. So we actually get a negative value here. Um, so that tells me that the rabbits are expected to go up, the foxes are expected to go down. And again, we would want to scale this um, to reflect that change, that it's only a half a year change. And so now this tells us by how much R and F go up. So I'm going to increase R by 0.8, and I'm going to decrease F by 0.1. And then we um, recalibrate. So um, any, any questions about that, this process? Um, so I would say, why don't you just take it out one more step? And the goal here is to approximate what are going to be the rabbit and fox population, say, one year from now.
Yeah, and if you've um, got it, no one has got it yet, don't worry. Um, just chat it in um, to me, and I'm just kind of, just want to keep track of how um, you guys are doing, how much time you need. Okay, some answers are starting to come in, so um, but not too many. So it's helpful if you guys just take your time, but um, if you do text it in once you get it, it helps me know um, where everybody is at. Okay, thank you um, for the responses that are coming in. Um, most of them are in um, the right ballpark here. Um, so the ones that are off, they have one of them right, but one of them wrong. So maybe I think it's just uh, a miscalculation as opposed to a misunderstanding. Um, but let's kind of just recap these calculations. So um, we would plug in 1.8 and the 0.9 into the two systems or into each of the differential equation. So plugging it into the RDT, um, this comes out to like 3.132. Plugging it into DFDT was like a 0 0.396. So this tells me at this point, both of these populations are going up, right? Because they're both positive. Um, and then we scale them by one half since we're only looking at an increase of half a year. So that means that's about 1.566. And this one is like 0 0.198. And then that tells us how much to increase each of these populations. So this one would come out to about 3.366. And that would come out to uh, about that. Sorry, I realized my screen is Delay. Can you guys hear me? Okay, I think we can this, hear you. Yes. Yeah. There's a slight delay. Let me um, just disconnect this. Okay. Um, okay, that seems filled in now. Okay. Uh, so, so sorry. Uh, if you weren't kind of catching the um, calculations as I was describing them, right? We took um, these values, plug it into these equations, and that gave us the rate of change here and the rate of change here. Um, since these were both positive, we know both populations are going up. 
um, and we just scaled each of them to account for the fact that this is a half a year increase. So this tells us how much R goes up. This tells us um, how much F goes up. Okay, any questions about that? Okay. Um, so to kind of take our trip down memory lane, when we were working with one differential equation, kind of first we talked about numerical approximations using Euler's method, and then we talked about graphical approximations using a slope field. So I want to take a look at the equivalent of a slope field in um, when we have a system of differential equations. And so um, when we had one differential equation, right, our slope field just looked like that. And now that we have um, two things that are depending on t, we're going to have to use like an x, y, z coordinate frame where we have rabbits, time, and foxes arranged in some way on these axes. Um, so in order to picture this, uh, I'm going to suggest that we use some technology. So I'll share my screen as I um, use this app over here. But if you want to play around with it, you can click on the link. The link is also uh, in Canvas, um, just underneath where this worksheet is. Uh, okay. So let me jump over into... My browser. Okay, and so if you open up um, that website, then um, you are probably looking at something like this. And so over here is our differential equation. Um, and I'll just say up here, we can choose different approximation <laughs> methods. Um, and so we can choose either Runga cutter or um, Euler's method to, to do these. So what we just did was Euler's method. Um, and so if we want to kind of see what that looks like, we can flip over to that. I'll just say that um, the Runga cutter method is actually a more accurate method. Um, it takes into account more information when, when it's making. It's a modified Euler's method, I'll just say. So um, let's say, for example, here, I don't, can you guys see my pointer? Um, yeah, OK. So let's say um, we've got this differential equation. And what I want to consider is, let's say we start with three, so maybe like 300 rabbits and two, meaning 20 foxes. And we want to see what's going to happen as time goes on. Um, then. Um, let's kind of generate this animation. So I'm just going to click on the, um, generate ring of cutter. And it does all of these approximations over here. And let's see what that looks like on um, this equivalent of a vector field that we have over here, a slope field. So um, this is just plotting all of those approximations that we just did. So it like plots the approximation that we got at time 0.01 if we did it much more finer. And, and it's just taking all of these approximations and then just connecting the line through them. Uh, and so definitely much more complicated to try and picture these. Um, so what we do is kind of a similar trick for those that have taken or are currently taking um, multivariable calculus is that we look at cross sections. We look at projections into different two-dimensional um, planes within this three-dimensional space. So what I mean by that is we can take a look, for example, at how the fox population changes with time just by rotating this graph and focusing in on the relation between just f and t. And so this is uh, an approximation. I'm just going to sketch it over here. And then we can kind of discuss what, what, hap what story is going on with these populations. So here, we've got t 
versus F. And so in particular, we're told that at time um, zero, F is equal to two. So it makes sense that we see this dot at two at time zero. And then the population goes up, it goes down, it goes up, it goes down. So it looks something like this. Ah, oh, sorry, you're not seeing my graph. So it, it looks like this kind of cosine function over here or a sine function over here, but it makes sense that we might have some sort of trig relation over there. So if I'm looking at this graph, I can see that the Fox population starts off at two, right? It reaches a max of four, and then it goes down to about one and then back up to four and then down to one, back up to four and down to one. So we can see that the Fox population is bouncing back and forth between approximately um, one and four. So the Fox population is not getting infinitely large and it's not dying off. It's just gonna cycle through um, different values. And then we can do the same um, for R. We can see this. So on your homework assignment related to this, you're gonna have to use this app to construct some plots like this. Um, so I would definitely recommend playing around with this app. It's not um, an optional part. Um, so for this one, now we're taking a look at what's happening with um, time and rabbits. So um, I'm just marking up um, question 3A on the worksheet if you're following along. Um, I'm just plotting the graphs that I'm seeing um, via this app. And so we can see um, from this one that the rabbits are oscillating between three and then going down pretty close to zero and then back up to three and so on. So these are also looking like some cyclic behavior. And then um, finally, we can take a look at what's happening. Um, if I get the right, sorry if I'm making you dizzy. <laughs> um, though I wanna get rabbits and foxes here. Aha. Come on, voila, okay, right there, okay. And then we could take a look at um, just how rabbits and foxes are related to each other. And, and here we get this cyclic um, behavior. So um, any, any questions so far about these different graphs and what we're actually seeing in the three different graphs that we've looked at? So each time we rotate, would that be like a partial F, partial T? Is that what we're viewing? Um, no, it's, it's more like looking at a cross section. So it's like um, we're fixing a value for, um, one of the variables, and then we're looking at how the other two um, change. Um, yeah, and so we just wanna be careful there. We have all of these different relations. Um, let me come back over into the worksheet. So we have these um, three different graphs that we saw by manipulating the graph and, and just isolating to the relation between two different variables. So we can take a look at how the fox population is changing with time. We can look at how the rabbit population is changing with time, or we can look at how the fox and rabbits are changing with each other. And so when we're working with systems, that's the whole point is that we wanna know how these two things are interconnected with each other. So out of these maps, this is the one that's gonna be most useful to us. And let me just say, um, this is what's called the phase plane. And so we'll do quite a bit of phase plane analysis. So this phase plane, I'll just say, is kind of the equivalent of a slope field that we worked with when we had one differential equation. Um, and so 
we've got our um, pictures over here. And again, all three of them are, are quite useful. The problem with this one over here is that we don't have any indication about what's happening with time, meaning um, we could be moving along this curve in this way, moving counterclockwise, or maybe we're moving clockwise and it's not clear. So I know that at time zero, we're starting off with um, three rabbits, two foxes. Um, so we start off at this point, but then I'm not sure whether at first, which thing is going up and which thing is going down just by looking at this graph. So it's gonna be useful to figure out whether things rotate that way um, or whether they rotate that way. It can't be both of those directions. Okay, so um, let's think about telling a story here for this one. So maybe um, I'm gonna break us up. This will be a quick discussion, I think. Um, I just want you to bounce some ideas off of your classmates. So I'm just gonna break us up into breakout rooms um, briefly where I just like you amongst your groups to come up with a description of what's happening. So like, okay, initially I'll start the description. We start off with um, 300 rabbits and 20 foxes. Then as time goes on, we can see the fox population is doing this and the rabbit population is doing that. And so you just wanna describe what's happening as um, time goes on for these. Uh, okay, so let's see. Breakout rooms. Um, Just one question yeah. before we go in the breakout rooms. Now, which way are we assuming that goes? Is that clockwise or counterclockwise for time? Yeah, that, that's part of the um, process that I'd like you guys to think about. So, oh, um, okay. So, so I'll just say that you do have pictures of the foxes and the rabbits themselves. Um, so you can see that as time goes on, is F at first going up or is that F at first going down and, and the same for the rabbit. So you can use this information to help figure out which way you're moving around this curve. Okay. That's my hint. Okay, so I'm gonna put you up into smaller groups of either two or three people. Um, and so I just like you to spend maybe, you know, at most five minutes, maybe just coming up with a description of what's happening in this scenario. Okay, thanks. And if you have a question, just hit the button that asks for help and I'll, I'll pop in. Um, what's happening at first? So, okay, let me just say initially. There are say 300 rabbits and 20 foxes. Okay, what happens next? So feel free to chat in or just um, unmute yourself. Let me know what you guys said. Uh, the foxes are chatted in? Uh, sorry, what would you say, Brian? I think it was Brian. You must have chatted in? What's to say it? Ah, okay, sorry, yes, I see. Uh, fox population increases rabbit population um, decreases. So um, I guess be a little bit careful here because at first, I think I drew this accurately. I think it starts to head up. Both of them start to head up. Um, I think, let me just double check the graph. Oh, maybe not. I think my graph uh, is, is not so accurate. Down. Yeah, let me um, fix that. So the graph actually looks more like this, I should say. Yeah, so that makes sense. So at first we can see that um, the foxes were going up. We can see that from over here and the rabbits were coming down at first. So that means we start by heading off in, in that direction. Ah, again, my iPad, we've got a delay here, sorry. Okay, 
So yeah, so at first um, we start over here and then we can see the foxes go up, rabbits come down. So that's all I've said over here. Um, so I guess at first what's happening is that the rabbits are living large, right? They've got plenty, uh, excuse me, the foxes are living large. They've got plenty of food supply here. Um, and as a result, the rabbit population is, is decreasing. Okay, and then we kind of hit this point over here. And what's, what's happening, what's significant about this point over here? Um, <laughs> there's a slight delay right here. It's the max fox population. Yeah, so at this point over here, um, we've reached kind of the max fox population. So it probably takes into account what's happening um, over here. And so now um, the fox population starts to go down. Okay, and you might want to think about, well, why would the fox population start to decrease? Well, it's because their food supply is decreasing, right? So the rabbit population was going down. Um, okay, so they're decreasing due to competition amongst themselves um, and the rabbits are continuing to decrease. And then we hit like a point um, over here. And what's kind of significant at this point over here in black? The foxes have died out, and <clears throat> died out enough to allow the rabbits to start repopulating. That's right. So at this point, we suddenly stop heading to the left. So when we're heading to the left, that means the rabbits are going down and we've suddenly, now we start heading to the right. So that means now at this point, the rabbit population has reached its minimum point, which would be um, about over here, and then it starts to increase again. So it's important to kind of see these different connections. You can almost picture like, as you're moving this dot around this um, cyclical path, you should see the equivalent of how it's tracing out these two different curves. Okay, and so then eventually um, the fox population that the rabbit population starts to increase um, up until the point where now suddenly the foxes have enough food and now their both populations are increasing at, at that point. So let's see, you can mark this one in um, blue. That would be at this point over here. Um, we've got um, enough rabbits to sustain a larger fox population. And so both of these populations are increasing until they reach this point and then it all repeats over again. So we get these very cyclical patterns in a lot of these ecosystems. Um, and let me just say that the dynamics here, um, very, very similar models are actually being used to predict um, spread of COVID. They, they use a system of equations called um, SIR models, which are very, very similar to this, just they take into account three different populations. Those that are susceptible, that haven't been infected yet, those that are immune, they either they've been vaccinated or have already been infected, um, and um, those that are currently infected. And you can look at dynamics between how those three different populations interact um, with each other. So we can take a look at some of those applications as we um, move a little bit forward since that stuff is obviously very um, 
relevant to what's going on at the moment. Um, but any, any questions about how we can read these graphs? Um, I'll just say that, you know, don't discredit the, how valuable this information can be. Sometimes way more valuable than the process that we go through for finding an exact solution. Um, we can tell pretty much everything about this system just using these approximation methods. Uh, let's see, sorry, I think there might be a, a question. Ah, okay. Um, any, no questions? Okay, so let's kind of think about a similar analysis, um, but now we're gonna change the situation. So instead of um, starting with um, 300 rabbits and 20 foxes, we're gonna start with 300 rabbits and no foxes. And um, let's try and figure out what's, what's happening um, without actually doing any calculations here. So we've got, these differential equations way back here that we started with. If, um, if you guys see that my screen is lagging, just please let me know. Um, I'm trying to keep up with it. So uh, I'm working on question four. And so um, the question here is, we have the same number of rabbits initially, but now we're gonna start with um, zero foxes. And so um, without needing to do any calculations like we did before or without having to graph this, we could take a look at what would happen if this were our initial setting. And hopefully it makes sense with what your intuition might um, expect to happen here. So I can take these values, three and zero, and plug them into these differential equations. So that would give me um, the RDT. If I plug in zero for the foxes, that term goes away. And all that's left is three times R, which would be like nine R. And um, then we could take a look at the FDT. And if F is equal to zero, then that term is gonna go away. And that term is gonna go away. And the FDT would just be equal to zero. So um, what do you think is happening in this scenario? What do you think would happen if we start off with 300 rabbits and zero foxes? The rabbit population would continue to increase in for an infinite amount of time and the yep. fox population would stay at zero. Yep. So the this tells us over here the fact that the FDT is zero. This means the fox population is never going to change. And would it be nine R or just nine? Oh, thank you. Yeah, that's right. Um, well, I, I should say this. Um, yeah, initially the um, the rate would be nine, but as R is changing, this is changing. So I, sh I should leave that R in there. Yeah, thank you. Um, but yeah, we've also seen um, models like this. This is now like no longer dependent on F at all. This is just a very um, separable differential equation that, that we could solve. Um, but if you solved this, what would you expect to get as the solution? What type of function? Linear without bound. Yeah. Expect. Sorry. Oh no, I was going to say yeah, yeah, same. So um, this that solution is not going to be a linear function. Exponential. So, yeah. So when we solve things like this, so this is saying like the derivative of r is three times the original function. Um, Something like that would be a solution to this differential equation. So um, we actually get exponential growth if we're looking at the rabbits compared to time. 
So um, what we could see here is that, yeah, the rabbit population is going to increase now without bound if it doesn't have any predators and the foxes are not going to um, spontaneously um, arrive if there aren't any foxes here. They, have, they would have to be introduced. Um, so I do think it's important to kind of make sure that our intuition matches up with what these equations are telling us. And it's always good to do this check because if it's not matching up, then maybe you've got the wrong model to start with. You shouldn't discount what you know should happen with, you know, my model is predicting something else. Uh, any, any questions? Um, okay, and just to take a look at the picture for this setup, uh, the difference here is now we would set the fox population to zero. Let me um, reset this. Um, can you guys see the website? I'm making, yeah. Okay, I regenerated that, and let's see what this looks like. Um, so again, keep in mind, we're only looking at um, certain direction here. So um, what we could see here is that the um, fox population is going to stay zero, right? So if I were to grab foxes versus time, all we can see is that for all time, foxes are going to stay at zero. And then um, we can finagle this some more. Uh, to look at. Um, if you uh, click that advanced controls button, show advanced controls. Oh, does it does it do it automatically? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Ah, <laughs> good to know. Okay, so there's all of them. Uh, okay, that's really cool. Thank you for sharing that. <laughs> that stops my awkward moving around. Okay, so yeah, so here's our, our fox versus time. And I'll just say that these, um, this terminology, angler, cider, fronter, topper, by no means is that conventional. <laughs> I think um, this was like with an airplane in mind. So you can disregard those sorts of terms. Um, but here's the fronter, which is showing, uh, oh, I want the topper, which is showing the relation between R and T. That's what I was trying to get at. Um, and so this is showing that if we've got T and we've got R, that yeah, this does seem to be growing exponentially. And um, lastly, if we want to take a look at the phase plane, which is um, plotting R versus F, Um, we can see that this is also just moving along this axis, meaning F is staying zero and R is increasing and increasing and increasing. So when we're drawing things in the phase plane, we, it's good to get in a habit of um, drawing an arrow to indicate what direction you're, you're moving along. Um, so these were the corresponding projections that we had in each of them. And so again, for this last one, um, because we were looking at R and F and we lose sight of time, um, putting an arrow on the solution kind of indicates what's happening as time goes on. So in that sense, we do get to see how all three variables are interrelated. Um, okay, and I think um, we've kind of exhausted what's actually happening here. I think we've discussed the story in the sense that um, if there aren't any foxes, the rabbits have no predators and they're just gonna, that population would continue to increase without bound, at least according to this model. Um, okay, any questions? Okay, so um, we've kind of 
gone through how Euler's method, numerical approximations can be extended to these systems, how we can um, extend like the idea of a slope field to these systems. So next up is to think about how we can extend this notion of equilibrium um, to systems. So when we were um, working with one equation like dx dt, um, so these were, I should say, first of all, um, when we were working with autonomous differential equations, then we said an equilibrium solution is gonna be a solution where um, constant solutions, right? So we could set dx dt equal to zero and then try and figure out what value of x is gonna be a constant solution. So we're gonna to need to tweak that a little bit for systems of differential equations, but not drastically. Um, so if we're talking about, so what it means for one, um, differential equation to have an equilibrium solution means it has a constant solution. So meaning the initial value of X never changes. And we saw this sort of behavior when we had like the carrying capacity for the logistic population model. Then we saw like, okay, there is an equilibrium. If you start off with that like perfectly balanced population, it would never change. So if we're trying to think about this notion of equilibrium for a system of differential equations, does anybody have any ideas about what it might mean for a system to have an equilibrium? So um, for example, would you think about the um, case up here? So if we start with an initial condition of um, zero foxes and three rabbits, would you consider this um, an equilibrium solution for this system of differential equations? Uh, no, but if we had zero rabbits and zero foxes, that would be an equilibrium solution. Why is that? Um, because it wouldn't change. It would always, like, it for any infinite amount of time, there would always be zero rabbits and zero foxes. Yeah, so we can see that zero, zero would be one equilibrium. If we start off with no foxes and no rabbits, we're going to continue to have zero foxes and rabbits for all time. Okay, and so again, this idea of if we have no rabbits and no foxes, then that's going to stay the situation for all time. Um, good. And so um, what's wrong about this one is, yes, the um, fox solution is constant, right? That's flat, but the rabbit population is not. So um, when we're thinking about equilibrium for a system of differential equations, we want to make sure that both x and y are not changing. So we want to find the values of x and y, or in this case, r and f, that are going to make um, neither one of those values change over time. So that means we have two conditions that we need to simultaneously solve. Um, if I'm just using X and Y for like the generic variables. So um, in this case, we have this system. The RDT is um, 3R minus 1.4 RF. And uh, the FDT, that was minus F. that. Okay, I'm just pasting it over here. And so if we want to find the equilibrium, I'm just trying to shift my position with the sun over here. <laughs>
then um, what we want to do here becomes an algebraic question. where we have a system of differential equations, or excuse me, a system of equations that we need to simultaneously solve. And so this is the thing that you wanna be careful about, is we're not trying to find when is this thing zero, and then separately think about when is the other equation zero, but we wanna find values of R and F that simultaneously make both of those differential equations zero. So we can see that there's a trivial solution which is the origin. We can see that if I plug zero, zero into that equation, we get dr dt would be zero and df dt would be zero, but there are others. So that's kind of the first step. We're gonna set each of these things equal to zero and then solve the system. So if I want to solve this system over here, any um, thoughts about what we could do? You could just do um, substitution. So you could solve like, you know, one equation, you could put one equation like F in terms of R and then substitute it back into the other. Yeah, that's right. Um, so it's, Keep in mind here that it, this is a nonlinear differential equation, or I keep saying differential equation. It's a nonlinear equation here because we have these terms here. So when we were doing like undetermined coefficients, we were almost always getting um, linear equations in the end. But here we have nonlinear equations, but the same methods can apply. And substitution is very, very um, useful one. So I could solve this equation for f. Um, just my work over here. So we would say, okay, using this equation, we have that F is equal to 0 0.8 R F. Um, well, that's not gonna help, is it? So um, you were, you, totally good idea. Christina, do you wanna, um, do you mind kind of saying um, how we could solve for one of these in terms of the other? or anybody else for that matter. I don't want to put you on the spot. Uh, couldn't you use DFDT um, similar to what Christina said, if you uh, bring the F over the minus F over to the other side, then you have 0 0.8 RF. If you divide both sides by F, then you have 0 0.8 R equals one. Yeah. And then if you divide both sides by 0 0.8, then you can plug the R into the DRDT. Okay, um, let's, let's follow that process out. So we can, so you said we're gonna go from here and then what? Oh, sorry. Um, and then you divide both sides by F. Okay. I think we would get that. Um, yep, and then you divide both sides by 0 0.8. Okay. And that winds up being like 1.25, something like that. Is that right? Uh, sure, let's go with that. Um, and then if you plug that into R for the other equation. Okay, and so we get this, that this is actually um, good. <laughs> That's right. And then we could take this and plug it into um, the top equation mm -hmm. and solve for F. And um, I'll just save the calculation there, that comes out to 2.143, approximately. Does anybody see any potential problem with using this method to, to find the solution? So when we do this step over here, which was divide by F, we've made an assumption about F at that point, right? Which is that F is not zero um, because that would not be a defined operation if F were zero. 
And so if um, you were to do this method, we would lose this equilibrium over here. So just keep that in mind. Um, we would not have identified zero, zero as also being in equilibrium because we've made this assumption that let's disregard the case when F is zero. So just be careful um, about that. It's totally fine to do this. Then you just would then later want to consider well, what happens if F is zero? Would that possibly lead me to uh, an, another equilibrium? And in this case, it would. Um, but here we've got a second equilibrium of 2.143. Another um, option. Yeah. To solve for them is to take out the like terms in each equation. For like yeah. the dr, you could pull out an r. Yeah. So um, there are definitely other ways to do this. Yeah. So we could have started with this equation and said, well, I can factor in r out from this. And I think this might be a little bit safer than the previous method because we don't need um, to worry about missing some of these things because here we haven't made an assumption if, if there's a difference between dividing both sides by r as opposed to factoring r out and so now if we factor r out um, from this top equation we can see that r is equal to zero or f is equal to um, 2.143 if you were to solve that and then you can take each of these cases and plug it into df dt and um, in the case where r is equal to zero, plugging that in to um, plugging this back into the other equation, the r would go away and all we have left is the minus f. Um, so this would tell me exactly that therefore f has to be zero as well to make the other equation zero. And therefore zero, zero is one equilibrium and then you can take this 2.143 and plug it into this differential equation over here to figure out what the corresponding value for um, R would have to be. All I'm saying here is for this other case, we could plug that into the first, or excuse me, the differential equation for df dt, and then figure out what is the condition on r that's going to make that equal to zero, and that's the, the 1.25. Um, so there are two equilibriums. There are various ways that we can solve this system. I just want to warn you that you um, will need to be a little bit careful when you're solving these nonlinear systems to not miss any of the equilibrium. Um, but what's significant about these values is that they are exactly telling us um, if we start off with zero foxes, zero rabbits, we're going to have zero foxes, zero rabbits. If we start out with um, 125 rabbits and about 21 foxes, then that would be um, the equilibrium. We would remain constant populations of rabbits and, and foxes for all time. So um, if we were to graph that solution, if we had an in this initial condition, then the solution through that point would just be stationary. It would not move at all. The same for this solution over here. And then otherwise, we saw that we had kind of cyclical um, looking solutions that orbit around that equilibrium. Um, any, any questions? Uh, and so, We'll, we'll take a look at this idea in much more detail. I'll just say equilibrium. So here the idea is to just get a little introduction to what each of these terms are.
for real world applications, would there ever be 21, 2.143 boxes in uh, tens? Uh, so you could say like if, if we started with 21 foxes and 125 rabbits that the fox pop, that both of those values would not move much. Yeah, so if we're not exactly at 21, um, we can think about how big of a difference that is. And that's going to depend on whether our equilibrium is stable or unstable, right? So it's like, if I'm a little bit away from the equilibrium, are my solutions going to head towards the equilibrium or are they going to move away? Um, and they might do both of those or might do one or the other thing. Um, and that brings up this notion of is our equilibrium stable or, or not. Um, so here were the two equilibrium. Both of these things were significant. If we start with those populations, they wouldn't change. So yeah, let, let's think about this notion of um, stability or unstable. Um, so zero, zero, do you think that is, would be a stable or an unstable um, equilibrium? So like what unstable. would happen if um, rather than being perfectly at zero, zero, rather, you know, we started off close to that, but let's say we had like, 10 foxes and 10 rabbits. You think that population is gonna head back towards the equilibrium or head away from the equilibrium? Head away from the equilibrium? Yeah, so once you introduce some rabbits and foxes, they're, they're gonna multiply, they're gonna interact with each other and so on. Um, so it's possible that you, know, you wind up with rabbits and foxes that are really far away from where you started initially. Um, so zero, zero solutions that um, start close to zero, zero they may head far away as time goes on. Whereas, sorry, my iPad is like burning up in the sun. Um, whereas um, if we started off at this equilibrium in the um, middle right here, but we were just a little bit off from this equilibrium, right? It's not gonna go very far away, but it's a little bit different here in the sense that it's also not going to approach that equilibrium. Ooh, I'm watching my delay here. <laughs> there it is, okay. <laughs> um, so if we kind of start in the middle, over here, perfect, um, right? But we're just a little bit away from it. We're gonna get this little circular orbit around there but it's not gonna head back towards the equilibrium. Um, but we're still gonna consider this stable since if you start near the equilibrium, the solution will remain close to it. Let me just say this notion of close, we're being a little bit um, casual with it. Um, there's limits and deltas and epsilons and things like this at, at play um, so that you can get a little bit more technical about this. But for our purposes, we're gonna say that, okay, if we start a little bit away from here, that's not staying close to the equilibrium, whereas one of these circular orbits is staying pretty close to the equilibrium. Um, okay, so um, this is a good place to um, stop. So next time, um, which will be after the exam, 
we'll pick up from this and, and take a look at some phase plane analysis and um, equilibriums and do some um, kind of an introduction into a field of mathematics that are called like dynamical systems. Um, but we'll take a look at that after uh, the exam. So over the weekend, definitely give um, those review practice problems a look. Um, and if you have any questions, just let me know over the weekend and I can um, prepare some stuff for Monday to cover that material if you have questions about it. Um, otherwise, I've got a plan and um, we can just kind of review for, for the exam on Monday. So the exam is Wednesday, we'll review on Monday. Um, have a nice weekend, everyone. And if you have any questions before Monday, just, just reach out. All right, thank you. Yep, take care. All righty. Yeah. There any questions for anyone that's sticking around? Yes, I do have a quick question about that um, unstable equilibrium point at zero zero. Uh huh. Um. So, if you get close enough to that equilibrium point, I would think that you would eventually go to zero. Um, just because, if, for example, if there were, you know two rabbits and two foxes that you started out with, all the rabbits would be eaten and then all the foxes would die out? Yeah, well, let's take a look at what happens since I have this, we have this little thing here that could help us, this little explorer. So if mm -hmm. you started with two and two, mm -hmm. let me reset this and let's see what happens. And so it, 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 yeah, I mean, we can kind of dissect what it means to be close. I'm being a little mm -hmm. bit informal with that, but um, this one would be, so it's not like circling around the equilibrium. It's kind of giving us this little circular orbit, but it's not centered at the, at zero, zero. So in that sense, that's what's different about the other equilibrium that we saw versus this one is that mm -hmm. that other one was like the center of the universe where these things were going around so that we consider stable as opposed to this mm -hmm. one. Um, it's not in the center of one of these orbits. Okay. Um, even if we did something like, so I noticed that your R is two, which would be 200 rabbits. But if we did something like 0 0.02 and then 0 0.2 foxes, I'd yeah, be curious to and see. we'll see something similar here in the sense okay. that um, it'll just stay in that area. It'll stay in that area, yeah. And here we probably might not be able to see it because, yeah, it, mm -hmm. whoops, it is going to be like a small orbit, but it's okay. still going to be like the origins over here and the orbit is off to the side a little bit. Okay, that sounds um, good. Okay, thank you. Yep, no problem. Oh, actually, yeah, it looks like that. Actually, that's really interesting. Oh. That when we actually made it, it is why we can see that there's, I think part of the problem here is the estimation method. I don't think it actually would look like that. I think this is some error due to the estimation. Yeah. Yeah, that's fair. Okay, thanks. So okay, no problem. Much. See you later. Have a good day. You too.